Hey folks, welcome back to another Data Science 1 lecture. Uh, today we're going to talk about classification. So we've uh, been talking about uh, more specific issues with our projects, and one of the things that, that I think uh, we could still use a lot of clarification in are the types of models that are available to you uh, when you start to do your data analysis. So to, to talk about uh, the, the lay of the land here a little bit more broadly, uh, let's just introduce uh, a few uh, key taxonomies in machine learning. Uh, we'll, we'll start here uh, with the, the broad breakdown um, of the, the type of data and signal that you have um, uh, available to you, um, specifically labeled data or unlabeled data. Um, and, and also there will be a, a class of machine learning problems that we will totally ignore for this class uh, that are based off reward learning. Um, but uh, in, in short, uh, cases where we have label data, so when you know uh, a true outcome, at least for some subset of the data that you have, uh, we're going to call that supervised learning, uh, where uh, to, to contrast this, if we don't have uh, any instances or, or hardly any reliable instances of, uh, of true outcomes for our data set, um, instead, we're just trying to do some uh, little bit more exploratory uh, analysis. Uh, we're going to call that uh, unsupervised learning. And then uh, kind of partway in between, a slightly different problem um, of getting feedback uh, that, that you know uh, answers for rather than, than true labels. So you'll, you'll get a, a yes or a no answer for this was a, a good label or a bad label. Uh, but you won't, you won't necessarily know uh, what the true answer would have been. Uh, that, that kind of falls in the middle and we'll call that reinforcement learning. So what, what we're going to focus on uh, specifically today uh, and, and for the next uh, couple lectures as well uh, is the branch of machine learning that's uh, I think the, the most common for data science um, and, and probably the most common for machine learning in general uh, that we've already started to talk about a little bit which is supervised learning. So we introduced machine learning with regression, uh, and I think that that was a, a great place to start because that's a, a common formulation of having supervised learning data and trying to look at, uh, at relationships between inputs and outputs um, and, and trying to train models. Um, but uh, again, broadening our, our scope here, uh, today we're going to introduce classification, which is uh, uh, very similar to regression, but, but you'll see uh, has some specific differences and nuances, um, uh, especially when we get down to the analysis. Uh, the, the methods are, are surprisingly similar here. Uh, and and the, on the unsupervised learning side of things, we'll get to these a, a bit later uh, in the semester. Um, one of the things we can think about is clustering. So just asking uh, if we have a bunch of data, um, we don't know their labels, what general groups uh, might they cluster into? Um, or, or another very common uh, machine learning tool on the unsupervised learning uh, side of things for data science is dimensionality reduction. And there's, a, again, a, a whole handful of, of methods within that class, but we'll uh, talk about that uh, again a little bit later in the semester. Um, one of the things that we won't get to in this semester um, are the agent-based learning types of machine learning, which are a little bit further from data science um, and include a, a whole host of things, uh, most notably uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so we're uh, we're looking at uh, at supervised classification problems today. Uh, so uh, I've I've said that that the the methods are fairly similar to regression, um, and and in fact uh, we even had the the word regression in our title here uh, to suggest that uh, that what we're going to be doing is is very similar to regression. Uh, but let's talk about uh, kind of the the simplest um, and and maybe most subtle. Uh, distinction between regression and, and classification problems. Uh, so uh, recall from before uh, that linear regression is uh, building a model to predict the value of an output given some inputs, um, whether that's uh, you know a simple linear regression uh, where you just have a slope and an intercept or a multiple linear regression. Um, either way, you're, you're feeding in a bunch of real valued inputs, your x's, and you're trying to predict a bunch, uh, you're trying to predict the real valued y. Um, that's the, the output or, or the, the value of whatever um, target variable that you have. In classification, uh, 
the the inputs uh, can be the same, a, a bunch of real valued uh, numbers, but the, the outputs are, are what uh, distinguish it from regression where we're trying to predict uh, categorical variables. Uh, for most of today, we're going to talk about uh, binary uh, classification. So, uh, so yes, no, it, it, uh, the, the output or the, the uh, instance uh, or, or data point that we're looking at belongs to you know, one class or another class. Um, in uh, you know a sporting event, this could be uh, that your team wins or loses. Uh, in uh, in spam detection for email filters, uh, either it's it's spam or it's not spam, which uh, we we uh, call ham. Um, or uh, in uh, maybe a, a biomedical domain uh, that a, a patient has some uh, condition or disease or does not. Um, these. Uh, aren't uh, real valued uh, outputs like we had in regression, uh, but take a, a number of, of discrete, um, discrete choices. So uh, like, like I said, we're going to mostly focus on binary classification in this class, uh, in this lecture, uh, where our responses are uh, either one class or another. Think of this as true or false. Uh, often it's, it's written as, as zero or one. Um, but uh, this is just one example of classification. Um, the, the more general version of this is multi-class classification, um, where, where you could have a, a set of discrete variables, but uh, you know, a, a almost infinitely large, um, a, a very large finite set of, uh, of discrete variables. Uh, for example, uh, saying what the content of an image is, uh, whether it's a, a dog, a car, a, a boat, a strawberry, whatever it is, um, that that's an example of a of a many class, you know, often thousands of class multi uh, classification problem. So uh, th these sorts of problems aren't uh, well solved by logistic regression. Um, you can uh, you can cheat your way around them by building uh, binary classifiers for each of those classes individually and putting them together. Uh, but there are, are much more uh, well suited methods that we'll, we'll talk about later on. So for now, let's think about binary classification um, because that's the the one that's most applicable to our tool for today, which is uh, logistic regression. So to, to get into logistic regression, um, I, I could uh, talk to you uh, about the, the formulation and the, the properties of, of these models, um, and, and we'll touch on that really briefly. But to introduce it, um, I, I just want to show you some uh, visualizations because I think that's a, a, a much clearer way to show kind of just how similar this is to, to what we've seen before. Um, so starting from, uh, from our, our starting point of linear regression, um, this is, uh, just as we've said, uh, predicting the value of some output given some input, um, your, your x's and y's. Um, and uh, as we've noted before, linear regression is just fitting a line uh, through that data that best represents the, the trends that are available here. Um, and we'll uh, use our theta notation uh, just to be uh, consistent in, in general. Um, so. Here's a here's simple linear regression. We're uh, hopefully all familiar with this uh, by by now. Um, again, this uh, can be applied. Uh, all of the the ideas uh, in linear regression that can be applied to multi uh, multiple linear regression can similarly be applied to multiple logistic regression. Uh, but uh, again, for simplicity, let's just uh, treat it as the uh, the single dimensional uh, linear and logistic regression. So uh, to go from a regression problem where you're, uh, you are looking at a real valued output, uh, the, the way to turn this into a classification problem uh, is with, uh, with some threshold. Um, so let's, uh, let's say that that threshold uh, between the classes 0 and 1 is a threshold of 0.5. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about what these thresholds mean and, and maybe uh, how you might set values to them later in the lecture. Um, but, uh, but for now, just think of, uh, of uh, asking which points fall on either side of some arbitrary line. Um, and, and now you can tell that, uh, that we have a, a binary set of outputs. Either it's above the line or below the line. Uh, if we think of this uh, as some activation threshold, then either it's you know, uh, activated enough to be true or it's not. Um, and, uh, and whenever it's true, our value is 1. Whenever it's not, our value is 0. 
So I've, I've mapped all of uh, the, the values you see here in this regression line to the values 0 and 1, uh, depending on whether it's uh, above or below this particular threshold. So uh, so now we've we've gone from the, the light blue points to the, the dark blue points. So to, to build a model that, uh, that can fit these points, um, we, we could try and, and fit uh, the zeros and ones with a linear regression model um, for a, a number of reasons that, that I won't get into today because uh, they're a little bit deeper in the math than, than I want to go. Um, that's something you could try, but it, uh, it won't necessarily work very well. Um, so uh, in, instead, knowing that uh, we're looking at values between 0 and 1, uh, we simply apply a nonlinear function on top of our linear regression, uh, and that nonlinear function is the logistic function. Uh, so this is a, a sigmoid, uh, which it may be a, a little bit more familiar than the, the logistic function to folks. Um, and a sigmoid function just means a, you know, any S-shaped function. Uh, this particular sigmoid function, the logistic, happens to be one that maps uh, any value um, between uh, you know, negative infinity to infinity uh, to the value 0 to 1, uh, as, as you can see here uh, on, on the screen. And so this, this is really nice because it, uh, it means that we are able to uh, specify uh, you know the, the the two classes uh, primarily zero or one with some you know uncertainty between them um, and that, uh, that that this takes the the same form and, and shape as our our prior uh, linear regression models uh, where the, you know the, the more we have a variable X presumably the more likely it is that variable y will be true now, uh, as, as I've said, uh, these two functions are, are very similar, and, and you can tell actually, you know, in the space um, of x equals 0 to 1 here that they're identical. Um, but uh, but our, our logistic regression function, uh, again, um, doesn't allow values that are uh, above 1 or below 0. Um, and so going into this range of 0 to 1 uh, means that uh, we can roughly uh, consider this to be uh, the probability that, uh, that our output class is true or that it's false. Um, there's a, a few subtleties here, but uh, for, for intuition, um, consider this the, the probability of this classification problem being true. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's as simple as it is. Um, this is logistic regression. Uh, we've, uh, we've taken our simple, uh, simple um, linear regression problem and turned it into a classification problem. Great. So uh, just to be, to be really clear about this, uh, the name logistic regression, you can tell, comes from, uh, from the, the logistic function being applied to a linear regression problem. Um, but, but that's a little bit confusing because logistic regression is a classification type problem, not a regression type problem because of the type of output. Um, so just to, to hammer this in, um, even though uh, regression is in the name, it is a classification uh, model. Uh, but uh, since it's very similar to the regression models that we've looked at so far, it's a really nice place to start um, as we dig into classification. So to, to uh, reiterate what I just said in pictures slightly more formally, um, we can think of the logistic regression model as uh, a, a model to predict uh, binary categorical outputs. Um, and the response, uh, the, the output, uh, is roughly the probability that uh, the observation it belongs to, to class 1, which is to say uh, that uh, the, the binary uh, category is is true um, and uh, again uh, in math this is uh, is very similar to uh, linear regression um, that's uh, looking at, at real values and the way that we map this to binary classes is simply by applying the logistic function um, I'll, I'll say uh, that simply applying the logistic function and getting to our probabilities uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we have classes yet. Um, it, that uh, with uh, 
uh, a you know probability of forty six percent that uh, that uh, an output belongs to uh, one class or another. Um, that that probability distribution function doesn't necessarily give you a, a hard answer of whether uh, you're in class one or you're in class zero. Uh, we we need to, to threshold uh, to do that, and and that can be uh, uh, in many times a straightforward. Uh, thing to do in, in many times uh, subtly not um, and, and we'll spend uh, actually a decent amount of time today talking about uh, talking about uh, some of the subtleties of, of that as well uh, but uh, just quickly to, to go over the logistic function for those of you who, who aren't that familiar um, it's uh, as I said a sigmoid class function uh, which just means it uh, it's uh, an S-shaped function that, that squashes the range uh, down to, in this case, 0 and 1. Um, and, and the way that this behaves for models um, is to say that, uh, that depending on the, uh, the, the parameter that you've assigned to your sigmoid, um, it will change the shape um, of, uh, of what range gets uh, assigned uh, with greater probability to zero or to one, um, or vice versa. So, as you can see here, the the top row being negative means that uh, you know lower values of x tend to be true, where the bottom row of positive thetas uh, means that uh, the the higher values of x tend to be true. Um, and similarly, having larger magnitudes mean that we're more confident about uh, this particular input. Uh, uh, corresponding to a true or false output, and so you can see that uh, that the confidence that we're at class one or at class zero is is very uh, uh, is is uh, is very wide, and the the band between them is very narrow. To say um, that that you're you know very confident that it's true all the way up until you're very confident that it's false. Where on the, the right hand side, where we have a, a lower uh, magnitude of that parameter means that uh, in the intermediate range we're, we're less and less sure um, and so we uh, we hedge with values that are closer to in this case 0 0.5 um, for for not totally being true or not totally being false uh, you'll you'll actually kind of see very little of this as you're implementing these models um, because uh, you you won't often uh, actually uh, uh, plot these probabilities um, most often we'll be visualizing uh, just the distribution of outputs, um, which uh, again we'll show towards the end of the lecture today here. So uh, I mentioned a couple times already thresholding, which is to take these probability functions um, and, and turn them into uh, specific outputs. Um, so uh, li like I said, when we're talking about binary classes, we don't want a real valued output. And even though a probability is between 0 and 1, it's still a real valued output between that. Uh, what we want is just a, a single number that's, that's either 0 or 1 to say we're in one class or we're in, a, in, a, in another one. Um, and so to do that, we pair our logistic model that gives us that probability with some threshold that, uh, that tells us where to make that decision point. So our, our thresholds, uh, as you can see here, um, are, are simple thresholds that if you're uh, above it, then you're in that class and when you're below it, you're not. Um, and uh, and I, I said that there's a, an easy way to do this and uh, in a more subtle way. And the, the kind of simple rule to begin with is that uh, if you uh, have data that's, uh, that's well behaved, um, then more often than not, you can end up just setting this threshold uh, to 0 0.5, as, as you might guess makes sense in, in most cases. Um, and, and anything uh, above that is, is true and anything below that is false. Um, and for the most part, your model will be able to uh, adjust your variables or uh, adjust your intercept um, enable, in order to make it so that, uh, that you get um, a, a well-behaved classification output uh, between the two classes. And uh, again, we'll, we'll talk in a little bit more specifics about what those metrics could be uh, in, in just a minute here. Um, but uh, but yes, that uh, that uh, this threshold uh, by default in in many programs, in, including uh, the logistic regression function in, in Scikit-Learn, that the most of you will be using for your regression problems, 
uh, is, is by default 0 0.5. Um, but uh, that uh, certainly doesn't need to be the case. Uh, you can think of, uh, of uh, examples of outputs where the, the model could say, you know, we want to be uh, very conservative in when we say things are true, and so we set our threshold very low. Um, so if, if we're at all uncertain about whether a output is true or not, we call it false. Uh, or, or on the, the the converse, you know, we're we're very optimistic about uh, uh, about these this class being true. Uh, we want to try and and show that it is, or or suggest that it is whenever possible. So if there's you know any chance that this class is true, we're we're going to call it true. Um, and and you can maybe already uh, imagine some instances of of uh, different domains or scenarios where you might want to have one or the other. Um, so, so I'll say uh, that uh, that how you set the threshold will depend uh, on your problem and, and domain in particular, and we'll talk about that uh, again a little bit more in a second when we uh, talk about how this impacts the, the output metrics um, that, that you'll be measuring your models with. So, uh, so, so what are those possible outputs? Um, the, the first and, and most intuitive is simply accuracy. Um, so this is uh, what we typically think about when we are asking uh, how good a model is in in kind of plain English. Uh, this is uh, is the the score of our model, um, and this is this is how well it, it behaves, um, which is to say the the total number of data points that are correctly classified over the the total number of data points that that you have. Um, so this is a, a, a great metric to start with, and um, I, I would say uh, I, I would highly suggest uh, measuring and, and reporting accuracy kind of regardless of what other metrics that, that we're about to talk about you also report, um, because it, it, it is uh, the, the, the most common and, and most intuitive one to, to think about. Um, but uh, it, it may not always tell the, the whole story. So, for example, think about uh, you know maybe an email filter um, that's that's looking at all of your incoming emails and trying to decide if they're spam or not. Um, where uh, it, well, it's since it's a spam detector, we're going to say that uh, for it to output true means that uh, it is spam, and it to output false means that it's it's not. So, uh, most likely, uh, hopefully, uh, depending on uh, on how liberal you are giving out your email address, most of your email uh, will, will be actual email and, and not spam. Um, and so, uh, so your your distribution will not be you know all that well quote unquote behaved um, because uh, because it'll be highly in this case imbalanced. So, what does that mean for our metrics? Uh, so if uh, if we were to make up uh, a, a a classifier to tell whether or not your email was spam or not, um, you could define a uh, a model that uh, simply was a, a zero order model that didn't even look at, at the email and just uh, every time said uh, said that the email is not spam. And this would give you an accuracy of, of 95% because you'd be correct 95% of the time. Um, and, uh, and despite it, uh, it having uh, a, a metric that sounds really good here, it would be of absolutely no use to you um, because uh, it, it would be you know, no more informative um, and, and in fact would literally do nothing and it would let everything pass into your inbox. Uh, so this is to say that, that we may uh, want to think about each of the classes that we're predicting differently. Um, and we, might, we might want to say something about how well we do on the instances that are spam uh, compared to how well we do on the instances that are not spam or, or something uh, along those lines. And, uh, and there are lots of different metrics that are somewhere along those lines. Uh, so we'll, we'll give a, an example of a, a few um, in, uh, in the rest of the lecture and, and point you towards, uh, towards some resources um, to, to look up some others on your own time as well. 
So uh, what, when I say uh, think about the, the two classes, um, uh, assuming that we have you know a, a true and a, a false or a positive and a negative class, uh, again, corresponding to, to one and zero respectively, um, we might care about the, the true positives and, and true negatives, um, which is to say when you're uh, accurately uh, predicting your output class. Um, but uh, it also uh, makes a lot of sense uh, to think about the, the false positives and the false negatives. Um, so a, a false positive is, is simply a, a false alarm um, where you think that it's true. Uh, you think that some event has happened or, or some class is the case. You think that an email is spam, but actually it's not. Uh, and then your, your false negatives, um, which are, uh, are I, I feel like, slightly less uh, intuitively thought about when you're looking at accuracy, but uh, in many cases very important um, when, uh, when you uh, talk about uh, how often you fail to, uh, to flag something that, that occurs at all, um, which is to say, uh, you know, when a, a, a piece of spam comes in, um, but you, uh, you let it through into your, your primary inbox. Um, and uh, just a, a quick side note that the, the table we have here is, uh, is in the order in which scikit-learn outputs the, uh, this, uh, this table, um, but we will not uh, always be able to, to say that it'll be in this order. Oftentimes, uh, the, the true positive is in the, the top left corner and the, the true negative is in the bottom right. Um, but uh, but but e either way, uh, this uh, th this table right here is is something that is uh, uh, really helpful to to think about, and in fact, uh, it, it has a specific name, a confusion matrix, um, which uh, which is to to say uh, how how often and in which ways our model is confused or, or gets answers wrong. Um, and so, in uh, in either version of this, what you expect um, is the the diagonal here um, of you know your your true your accurate results, the the true negatives and true positives to be quite high, um, and obviously you would like the uh, the the other two squares, the the false negative and false positive, to be low. Um, but looking at uh, at uh, how you trade off these uh, these two different types of uh, of of errors, your false positives and, and false negatives. Um, you may have called these, uh, you know, type one and, uh, and and type three errors in in basic statistics. Um, that uh, that uh, you uh, you 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 might say something about the the way that the model works and and how you might be able to to tweak or improve it. Um, or, uh, or, or how you, uh, with, again, with your particular domain, think about these thresholds. Uh, so I know it's a, a tiny bit hand wavy for now, but uh, let's, let's dive into a, a little bit more detail uh, on that in particular. Um, so there, there are, uh, as I said, uh, lots of metrics that, that think about uh, you know, all, all four of these quadrants. Um, and uh, uh, one, one set that, that we'll talk about is precision and recall. This is a, a really common uh, way to frame uh, data science uh, classifiers. Um, so accuracy, of course, you've mentioned is the, the uh, number of data points you get correct, your true positives plus your true negatives over the total number of data points that you have. Um, but we can also think about, uh, about precision, which is uh, what uh, proportion of the uh, the predicted true values actually were true. Um, so this is uh, your true positive rate over the the total number of uh, examples that you thought were true, which is to say your true positives and your false positives, um, all of your your positive guesses. Um, and and this is uh, th this is uh, really nice if you. Uh, are given predictions from a model, and you want to know how well you can trust those, um, which is is often the case with a a, a model in that uh, you know what you have is not your actual data. You you don't know anything about the underlying distribution, uh, but what you do know about is is your prediction, and you want to know how trustworthy that is. Now the the other uh, version of this is the recall value. So um, 
So uh, in, in this case, uh, you know, regardless of your prediction, you want to know for people who actually belong to this class, um, what proportion were you able to correctly um, to, to correctly classify? So your, your true positives over all of the true values, which are your true positives and false negatives. Um, and, and this is something that, uh, that, that you care deeply about because this is uh, for the people who actually have this condition or the, you know, the, the emails that, uh, that, that actually are spam. Um, how well did you do in, in sorting them into the right categories? Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the balance between these two uh, is, is uh, something that's uh, a really delicate balance and, and it may not be totally obvious from just looking at these two equations. So uh, let, let me show you an example and, and draw some pictures. Um, so the, the trade-off that, that we want to think about here is, uh, is that um, the relationship between these two is, is very antagonistic. Uh, when we think about setting the, the threshold. Um, so for example, uh, in, in the case of our email spam, um, when we, uh, we were thinking about uh, setting all of the, the values to one, um, or sorry, uh, we were thinking of setting all of the values to zero for, for not spam, um, that, that's an example of a, a very naive classifier. If, if you were to set all of the examples um, to true, um, then, then you'd have a 100% recall for your model, um, which uh, again, looking at, at recall would mean that, that you would have zero false negatives because, um, or, or, or sorry, um, if you set uh, your classifier to always be uh, zero, I believe, um, then you have, would have no false negatives. Um, be, and and that would mean that your 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 recall would be a hundred percent. In the case uh, where you you set your output to always be one, um, then you have uh, you have uh, no uh, no sorry that I'm I'm confusing myself here. If you set your output to always be one then you're always uh, suggesting it's true, so you have no false negatives. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the, the, the slide was right. Um, and in that case, your recall is 100%. Um, and, and so you, you can see here but that by setting the thresholds, um, setting uh, uh, how, um, uh, how uh, confident you are or, or how conservative you are in each of these directions, um, you can uh, you can kind of fudge the numbers on uh, you know one of these metrics, um, but if you were to to set recall really low, um, then by suggesting that uh, everything is true, um, you might have a, a high number of false positives, and and so your precision would be very low. Um, so uh, so. Um, to, to make this uh, hopefully a little bit more intuitive than me stumbling over my words, let's uh, let's draw a picture of this. Um, so so let's look at uh, at how you can change the uh, effect on precision and recall as you change your your threshold. Um, and, and this uh, obviously has impacts on accuracy as well. So the 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 version of accuracy is maybe the the most straightforward one. Um, where let's uh, assume that you have a, a, a fairly well balanced problem, um, where uh, where your um, uh, your your number of classes is is about the same in each one. Um, you can think that uh, in the case where uh, about half the time your class is zero and half the time your class is one, if you were to set your threshold at zero or one. Um, that would mean that, that if you're considering everything to be true or everything to be false, you get the answer right about half the time. Um, and so, uh, so you can see the, the bottom two points at the uh, extremes on the right and left of this graph. And then uh, hopefully, if, if you have a, a good model with good features, um, you're able to expand upon that and uh, get, uh, get the majority of classes right. Um, if, if your threshold is, is somewhere in the middle, um, where, where you are kind of equally trading off the, the likelihood of uh, a class being uh, above or below your, your given threshold. Um, 
this uh, th this plot here is actually empirical data from a, a model. I, I won't go into the details of of what that model actually is, um, though you may be able to to guess from the the, the function here. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just say that this is is generally representative of of what uh, what this this curve tends to look like. Um, similarly, uh, we've said that the the precision versus the threshold um, uh, that as you uh, as you uh, predict more and more um, as you as you increase your threshold, you will predict fewer and fewer true values. So at a threshold of one, you'll predict everything to be false, um, and so. Uh, so when you uh, when you uh, look at the the precision function, that will mean that, uh, that you have perfect accuracy. Um, and the the far side of this, again, assuming a, a reasonably uh, distributed uh, a set of data, um, if you were to uh, assume that everything would be um, would be true with a threshold of zero. Um, you'd have a, a precision of about 0.5, uh, which is to say that uh, that half the time you'd be you'd be right and half the time you'd be wrong, um, and and so the the math comes out to, to 0 0.5, um, and, and this uh, this function generally uh, uh, trends monotonically upwards, um, and uh, and the Converse is true here for recall. Uh, so as you increase your recall and you uh, give uh, fewer and fewer um, uh, true answers, uh, your recall will go down um, because you are uh, you're increasing your false and negative rate by providing more false answers. Um, Whereas at the the other end of a threshold of zero, you are tending to uh, say true all the time, and so the number of false negatives you have is is very low. So uh, ho hopefully this this makes sense. Um, I I often uh, you know as you can tell fumble around with the the true negative false negative, um, or true positive false positive ratios, uh, but. Uh, what uh, what what maybe is is most uh, important to recall, um, and I have been trying to avoid using words like recall that, that mean something specific in this this context. But as you as you uh, may may acknowledge, um, the the most important thing to note here uh, is just that these two curves uh, tend to go in opposite directions, meaning that as one increases, the other one decreases. This is the, the the main takeaway from the last few slides, um, and and so as you might imagine, somewhere in the middle, these two curves cross, um, and for many problems, it tends to be around 0.5, give or take. Um, as you can see, it's not perfectly 0.5 here, but it's pretty darn close, um, close enough that that you could still fit a, a model to this data uh, quite well if you were to arbitrarily set your your threshold at, at 0.5. Um, but uh, the the relationship between precision and recall um, uh, isn't always that straightforward. So uh, uh, again, uh, to flip the the axes from before, we're looking at, at at the proportion of or the the value of precision and recall across the threshold on the x-axis. Now we're actually going to plot the precision versus the recall. Um, to look at the trade-off between these two, uh, and and as you uh, can expect, that the the recall uh, when it's perfect, uh, all the way to the right, is the worst version, is the worst value of precision, and uh, conversely, when recall is the worst, you get your best value of precision. Again, these two values are are antagonistic to each other. Uh, and so if you were to think about intermediate values along the way, you could set lots of different thresholds and see just exactly how that trade-off occurred. Um, and so uh, so by doing that, you would create what we have here is a, a precision recall curve. Um, and, and you can see uh, pointed out some examples of uh, different thresholds you might try. Uh, and in fact, uh, if, if you uh, go into to scikit-learn and ask them to, to 
display for your precision recall curve. Um, it'll, uh, like, like you can see, the, the fine-grained uh, changes here show you that for, uh, for virtually any value um, of your threshold. Now, what would be great if, is if we had a perfect predictor where uh, no matter what threshold you picked, your precision and recall were both perfect. Um, but in virtually any real problem, you will have a, a trade-off between the two. Um, and so looking at, uh, at actually the, the area under this curve uh, can tell you something about uh, how well your model works uh, as that threshold shifts. Um, and that's actually a, a great metric for thinking about how robust you are uh, to, to different preferences for, uh, for precision or for recall. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, taking the, the integral under this curve, or, or the, the area under the curve, um, is, is a common metric to use. Uh, much more commonly, we'll actually uh, look at the value under the receiver operator curve. Um, so, so often when you hear area under the curve, it isn't under this precision recall curve, um, but, uh, but you, you certainly could calculate that if you wanted to. Uh, but but let's talk about the the receiver operator curve in in just a second here. So uh, for the receiver operator curve, uh, instead of precision and recall, we'll use two slightly different metrics: uh, the the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Um, so uh, again, these are uh, uh, closely related uh, to our recall and precision. Um, but, uh, but as you can see, are, are slightly different metrics um, in that uh, the, the false positive rate, as you could expect, is how many false positives uh, you have uh, over how many people were truly false. Um, and the true positive rate is uh, how many true positive you, you chose over the total number of people who, uh, who, or the total number of data points where it was actually true. Um, and so uh, again, this uh, totally makes sense as a, a metric um, and, and is subtly different from the, the precision and recall that, that we showed before. Um, uh, but uh, the, the logic still stands where these two values, the, the true positive and the, the um, false positive rate, uh, are, uh, are antagonistic and opposed to each other. And so you get, uh, again, one of these trade-off curves. Uh, which we call the receiver operator curve. Uh, sorry, the uh, the receiver operator operator characteristic curve. Um, and so, uh, so uh, as we think about uh, looking at, at these two trade offs, how we prefer uh, to have true positives over false positives. Uh, once again, we can think about this as different values of the threshold and take the area under the curve. Uh, knowing that we likely won't be perfect, um, but uh, but that we will will get uh, you know some value here. Um, this is uh, is is kind of nice in that the the true positive rate, false positive rate, both go from zero to one, uh, unlike the the precision recall curve, um, where precision goes from 0.5 to one, uh, even though recall goes from zero to one. Um, and so uh, what that means is that uh, a, a kind of true guess, um, which is to say uh, a, a line that uh, is, is right across the main diagonal here, uh, going up and to the right, gives us a, a value of 0 0.5. Um, and so that's a, a nice metric for, uh, for, for true guesses, um, where the, the perfect curve that we have here, um, given that the, the unit uh, area under this curve is one, uh, gives us a, a, a nice ceiling as well. Um, so uh, just empirically, here is a, an example of a random model um, that uh, is, is completely uninformed. And for different values of the threshold, um, we are, uh, we're, we're trending right around um, a, a value of, um, or, or we're, we're trending right around this main diagonal, which looking at the area under it gives you a, an area under the curve of about 0.5. Okay, uh, I, I know we're starting to pile on lots of metrics. Um, let me just throw in, in one more uh, that's, that's commonly talked about, 
um, which is sensitivity versus specificity. Uh, so sensitivity is the, the true positive rate and specificity is the true negative rate. Um, I, again, I, I think it's, it's fairly intuitive to think about uh, how, um, how both of these would be important and antagonistic to each other. Um, usually we, we don't think about uh, uh, the uh, area under the curve for these two, but, but you certainly could if you wanted to. Um, but, uh, but sensitivity and specificity um, are, are uh, important for uh, a lot of domains, um, uh, especially uh, the, the healthcare field uh, uses sensitivity and specificity. Um, because you you care uh, not just about how many of the the people who actually uh, have a condition um, uh, catching those people, but you also care about uh, how many people without the condition you're able to uh, let's say uh, uh, save some procedure if if you're uncertain about whether or not they have it. And so looking at the the true negative rate is similar is important there just as looking at the the true positive rate is. Um, and to to acknowledge that I've thrown a lot of equations at you, uh, let me just say that there are uh, uh, many more that we haven't even touched on. Um, but that, uh, that looking at, at these few, the uh, accuracy, precision, recall, true positive, false positive, uh, and false and uh, true negative um, uh, are, are the, the common ones you often work with and, and the full list uh, you can grab uh, off of, of Wikipedia. Um, that, uh, that, that these values are um, are, are ones we, we should know about and, and think um, uh, about reporting when we're doing classification problems. Um, and visually, uh, I, I really like to see AUC curves um, in, uh, in, uh, in papers and confusion matrices are, are especially helpful um, if, uh, if there's some kind of non-trivial pattern, which is to say if the confusion matrix is, is non-symmetric, uh, if you have a, a, a especially a higher ratio of false positives to false negatives, or or vice versa, um, or you know many more uh, positive value, true positives than true negatives, um, then it's it's nice to to show the the whole distribution of um, of these uh, these values in in this you know mini heat map here of of the confusion matrix. Um, so, uh, so just to, to sum things up, because I know we're, we're getting a little bit long-winded here uh, on, on what is actually a, a very simple concept of uh, intro classification with logistic regression, uh, let's just say that, uh, that today we've introduced a, a kind of a, a new class of models, which is to say uh, uh, models that deal with discrete outputs or classification models. Uh, we've shown uh, the, the simplest version of this, which is a binary classifier built on top of linear regression, which is called logistic regression because it uses the logistic function to map us to a probability of zero to one. Uh, and we've mentioned that there are lots of complicated ways of setting the, the threshold on this logistic regression function to maximize your your value of, of interest, whether that's accuracy, precision, recall, sensitivity, specificity, or something else. Um, and, and the way that, that you can uh, tell how well a model works um, for differing values along this, along this trade-off is with things like area under the curve, uh, especially the area under the receiver operator curve for true positive and false positive rates. Um, but uh, but for the most part, what we'll end up doing is actually just setting this threshold arbitrarily at 0 0.5 um, and, and building a, a model around that. Um, and, and if there are uh, other issues about uh, things like highly imbalanced uh, data sets, uh, we, we may actually do some pre-processing or cleaning or data augmentation uh, to, to think about other ways around that as well. Um, but besides the working with the threshold. Um, and, and that's nice because those ideas are, 
are more general. And when we talk about multi-class classification later on in the semester, uh, th those ideas that, that we can bring up there um, are, uh, are, are a little bit more general um, and, and, and can apply more easily than a, a, a threshold, which as you can imagine, uh, it's, it's kind of specific to binary classification problems. Okay, uh, so I, I, I know that, that that felt like a lot. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the, the big picture um, uh, problem is, is, still, uh, is still clear though. Um, and uh, and the, the takeaway, which is uh, here's a tool for, for doing classification problems in your projects. Um, uh, again, we'll, we'll talk about the, a lot of the, the details and follow-ups of which there are many um, later on in the semester. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll wrap it up here for the, the sake of time. Um, so, uh, so so thanks for sticking through a, a, a long lecture again and we'll uh, we'll see you online. Thanks.